All right, everyone. This is the last of our live planetarium uh, sessions at 2.30 on Thursdays, because starting uh, next uh, week on Thursdays, you'll be able to see me in person live at the Fairbanks Museum. We are reopening on July 1st, which is a Wednesday, and on the first Thursday, I'm going to be doing what is a new series of uh, educational programs called Porchside Astronomy. And you'll be able to join me outside, uh, of course, taking all precautions with social distancing. You do need to wear a mask when you come to the Fairbanks Museum after we reopen. And I highly recommend you go online, check our schedule, and please book your tickets ahead of time because we have a new scheduling system to help accommodate uh, the smaller numbers of attendees that we can have in the building. However, with those slight complications, go to the Fairbanks Museum's website, you can get astronomy lessons live with me in person, and there'll be other educators like Hannah that will be doing astronomy on other days of the week. The schedule may change, but as of now, it'll be Thursdays that I'll be there three times a day. So check the website, but I'm sorry to say this is the last time we'll be meeting live online for the foreseeable future. However, uh, there's some things going on in the sky that I want to tell you about. I want to mostly spend our time talking about constellations today, uh, just to make sure you know everything that's going to be out there, the big ones, the bright ones, give you all directions today. But I also want to mention something that's going to be happening possibly, and I always say this with huge caveat asterisks because this may now pan out, but there is a comet called Neowise, and I learned this from the website that I recommend, spaceweather.com, Comet Neowise might become visible to everyone this July. And that would be very exciting because summertime, you know, it'd be nice to have a bright comet in the sky. It would give us all something beautiful and brilliant to talk about. But right now, Neowise is not visible to the naked eye yet. But astronomers that are observing it with telescopes are saying that it has just recently tripled in brightness. And if it does brighten enough, meaning that it's cloud, it's, it's coma, it's gaseous trail becomes long and big and bright enough, we'll be able to see it with our own eyes, brighter than most of the stars in the sky was one of the predictions I saw. So just think this could be a very exciting summer for astronomy. And you'll be able to ask me all about it at the Fairbanks Museum starting next week on Thursday. But for now, I'm going to use Stellarium one more time. And I highly recommend that software that you can get for free, Stellarium.org. And I'm going to show you what's going to be happening tonight in the sky. So here we are looking at the Stellarium daytime sky, just like it looks outside today. Sunny and bright blue skies and all the trees are fully leafed out. And of course, we want to see the sunset. But remember, the solstice just happened a couple of days ago on the 18th. So we're basically still in that time when the days are much longer than the nights. And although the day length has shrunk minutes, maybe less than minutes, uh, you won't really notice it until maybe the middle of July when you start to say, hmm, the sun is setting earlier than it used to. Then we'll see that fall will already be coming, but we still have a long time to enjoy. In fact, as of right now, it's six hours and two minutes until sunset, and it's already 2.30 in the afternoon. So at 8.36 tonight, and I'll show you that with Stellarium, by fast-forwarding time, we will get to see a sunset. That's always a tough time for kids. If you have an early bedtime, you may not get to see any stars at all. If you're in bed by nine, you won't see the stars. But let's watch the sunset here. Now we have a moon in the sky again since the last time we spoke. We talked about Venus and the moon having their little uh, conjunction and the occultation last week. But now look at where the moon is. It's already up in the sky before the sun sets. It's in the waxing crescent phase. And you can actually do that very easily in Stellarium to zoom in on things all the way to up close. But it'll be out in the sky before it gets dark. So the kids that have early bedtimes, that might be the only little light in the, light in the sky that you see tonight. But let's go on a little bit past the sunset. I don't want to go too fast. Stellarium gets a little wonky if you go a little too fast, it'll go through day and night every second. And that was very disorienting to say the least. But here we are. All right, I'm going to
to go a little faster here. All right. So just as a reminder, it's kind of funny to think that even now into summer, you can still see the heads of the twins of Gemini. They are very persistent. They're visible partly, at least, for most of the year. But we could say goodbye to them now. We'll see them again late in the fall. But that moon, that moon is right near the heart of the lion constellation. One of the constellations that I want you to see. It was a sign of spring. And now that we're into summer, you can see that Leo the lion is in the west, heading downward towards the horizon, which means that in a few weeks, you won't see him anymore. But you can still see this constellation now. Perhaps it inspired the ancient Egyptians to build the Sphinx. And if you use the animations or the illustrations that come with a, a Stellarium, then you can actually see that the lion picture is pretty convincing with the stars alone. So for one last time, let me show you how to see Leo without all these uh, handy illustrations that you might have. The brightest star of Leo is going to be right below the moon. It's called Regulus. And that, of course, is also a Harry Potter character, Regulus Black. But Regulus, the heart of the lion, is its brightest star. And if you find Regulus, then it's easy to see that right beside it, you have the nose and the eye and the stars that make the mane that has a general sickle shape right here. And that is the head of Leo the lion. And so the moon looks like it's in his belly. In fact, that's always a little joke that I play with Leo the Lion, because if we go back last night, the uh, night before, which you can do by pulling up the clock for date and time, or using the minus and plus keys on your keyboard also, last night, if you were watching, the moon was right in front of the lion's mouth. And tonight, the moon is in his belly. So this happens a lot once a month during these months, during the summer, spring and summer months. So this is not a rare thing to see, but uh, you know, it helps animate the sky and it helps re you remember that Leo is on that path that the moon follows. That line we call the zodiac, the ecliptic, the horoscope line. And I've talked about it many times in previous episodes if you wanna learn a little bit more about it, but one of the things about Regulus, the brightest star of Leo the Lion, is that it is the closest star to that line that I know that's very bright. So it helps you visualize where that zodiac is. And the moon is always a few degrees above or below that line. And just to finish the thought, ecliptic, we call it that because if the moon is exactly on that line, when it's a new moon, there will be a solar eclipse. And if it's exactly on that line, when there's a full moon, there will be a lunar eclipse when the moon, a blood moon, when the moon gets dark and turns red. So the ecliptic has that name because of eclipses, but it's traditionally known as the zodiac or the horoscope. And let's get on with this. So that's Leo the lion there, bright. Other bright star, Denebola, the tail of the lion over here. So if you make that the tail, and here is his rump, and you can see his hind legs here, then it's easy to see the picture of the lion. But even if you get stumped, just remember the sickle-shaped mane and head of the lion, and that will be enough to find Leo with the moon marking his belly. But there's the star Denebola. And I want to move down to the queen season. Constellation is one of my favorites because of its perfect timing with our seasons outside and the vegetation that grows mostly in the spring and summer and decays in, in the fall and winter. Well, we have the constellation Virgo right centered in the middle of the sky right now when the flowers are blooming and summer is at its height. And the brightest star of Virgo is Spica, which represents a flower. In my mind, it's a flower that fell from her hand. And I'll show you what I mean, because before I show you the Stellarium illustration, let me show you my personal version of Virgo, because I see her like a, a person that looks like she's falling out of the sky. Oh, sorry, folks. I apologize. I think I misplaced something. Hold on. Stellarium jumped on me here. There we go. So if Spica is part of Virgo, but it's not really part of the lady that I see in the sky. Now, Virgo, as a reminder, if you haven't watched previous episodes, has been associated with different goddesses on different continents. The ancient Egyptians thought of her as Isis, their goddess of fertility in the times of the pharaohs. And 
if you went into Asia, like Mesopotamia, where modern day Iraq is, they would have told you she was Easter, a goddess known to those ancient Mesopotamian societies. And if you were to go into Europe and talk to the ancient Greeks centuries, millennia later, they would have told you that that was Persephone or what the Romans called Proserpina, the goddess of flowers, the goddess that is the daughter of Demeter. So flowers are associated with this constellation in a lot of ways, and you only see her in the spring and summer, and in the fall, she disappears. And if you know the Greek story, just to run through it quickly, she has to go back to Hades town. She lives with Hades for half of the year, and she lives with us and her mother Demeter, mother nature, for the other half of the year, it's a great story. I wish I had more time to tell it properly, but you can also hear me talk more about it in previous episodes of these uh, Thursday shows that are still archived on the Fairbanks Museum's website. So let me go on with the picture. If you still don't see the lady, Spica is part of uh, the constellation, but not part of her body. But Spica is close to the four stars that I see as her torso. This trapezoid right here, I won't go into the names of the stars, but they have their pretty names like Minelova and Porima. But these are her shoulders. And here are the stars that make her waist, Hez. And this one that apparently doesn't have a name, but I see it as her left hip. So these two stars and these two stars make a trapezoid, this four uh, star set. And then you can make her body attached to that. Here is her right shoulder and then her right elbow and her right hand, diadem, another pretty word. And here is her left shoulder, her left elbow. Oops, I missed the star. There we go, Zanaya and Zavi Java. So I don't know the origins of all of these names. Many of them are Arabic, if not Greek or Latin, but this is her left arm. This is her right arm. And in between her arms, you can see the stars that make her eyes. And that's my favorite part of this constellation is that she has a face with a chin, a nose, and eyes. And this little triangle, generally speaking, looks like a face in distress. And that makes sense because if you put this all together, she looks like she's falling from the sky. And I still haven't shown you her legs. But over here, another little rectangle trapezoid shape on the other side of Spica is these are her toes. Oops, there's her other toe. And here's her ankles. So if you can draw these two little parallel lines, almost parallel with those stars, you can see her feet. And then her legs stretch towards where her hips are. And I do understand that this is not the easiest constellation. You may notice that most of her stars are very faint, but Spica is radiant and bright. And that one will take the cake. So look at Spica. And then, especially on a moonless night, or now when the moon is just a, a crescent, not too bright, this is a time to look for Virgo because when she disappears in the fall, she'll disappear head first and you might only see her legs sticking out. And it looks kind of funny to me. It looks like she's falling into the underworld like the ancient Greek story says. So Virgo next to Leo together, these uh, constellations are very bright in the center of our sky for this time of year in the evening. But if you've watched other episodes, you may also recognize who's lurking on the horizon. It's Gitas Gog, or that's the Abenaki name for the serpent with horns, or it's the scorpion, Scorpius. That's what the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Babylonians thought it was up there, a scorpion, a desert creature that would not have been seen here in Vermont until the Abenaki folks got cable subscriptions to Discovery Channel, and then they could see scorpions in Vermont. So the native Vermonters, saw the lake monster from Lake Champlain, Champ, and the folks in the Mediterranean saw the scorpion. And we're, regardless of what you see in these stars, the little illustration for Stellarium is a pretty good match to the stars, but there's one star, Antares, that's brighter than them all in Scorpius. And that one is the one whose name means not Mars. And you have a chance later in the summer and the fall to see Mars and not Mars near each other in the sky because Mars will be rising before the sun comes up. Maybe we'll get to that, but I also want to mention the summer triangle. So you've got not Mars and Taurus as part of the scorpion constellation. Here's the right claw or the head of champ. Here's the left claw or the horns of champ. And here's the 
neck of champ or the head of the scorpion and both of them have a rounded back and if you do stay up late you will get to see the entire thing if you have a level horizon most of us in vermont do not but there is the hook shaped tail of the scorpion that you have to be up on a mountain to see from Vermont or out in the middle of Lake Champlain, which is so great, that connection. And of course, if you are a fan of the movie Moana or a fan of Polynesian culture and the traditional stories of the Hawaiian peoples, well, this is Maui's big fish hook too. So we've got a lot to look for with this. But before I go on talking about any more constellations, I want to remind you that at the same time that the scorpion will be fully visible, which at this time of year will be about 11 o'clock but later on in the summer you won't have to wait up so late remember that we also have jupiter in the sky and i i don't know if i reminded you folks about this with previous uh episodes but in solarium you can zoom in all the way and see what jupiter looks like and actually this is accurate because I've, I've tested it with telescopes it's that accurate and one of the moons ganymede is in front of jupiter which means it will not be visible when you look for it with a telescope. And if you go look at uh, Galileo Sidereus Nuncius, his starry messenger, the book that he published with his observations of Jupiter, he noticed that there were sometimes three or four uh, lights around Jupiter and he noticed that they moved around and sometimes they were only partly visible, sometimes all four were visible. And he eventually realized that they were going around Jupiter and that was part of how Galileo figured out the nature of the solar system with his little telescope, only had 25 times magnification. And that heralded the beginning of modern scientific observational astronomy. Thank you, Galileo. Galilei, a teacher, a math teacher. So that moon, Ganymede, a place with possible oceans under ice. And there's a lot of interesting things about the moons of Jupiter, but I'm not going to be able to get to all of those things today. But you can talk to me about them on the porch of the Fairbanks Museum for Porchside Astronomy starting on Thursday, July 2nd. And I hope to see you folks out there for that. However, remember that there's another planet out here too. So back to where we were looking at the Scorpion constellation and I do want to remind you, Sagittarius is there, but the Sagittarius is the one that looks more like a teapot. And that's going to help you find uh, Jupiter, which really won't, <laughs> you won't need much help to find it. It's going to be very bright. And next to it, the old conquered father, Kronos, Saturn. And if you zoom in with Stellarium, you can see the rings. And this will give you an approximation of what to expect if you do have access to a telescope. But there are lots of moons around Saturn, and you probably won't easily see all of them with your telescope, but there are dozens of moons that we know around Saturn. One of them, the one that will be the easiest to find, the brightest one, is this orange dot called Titan, the one where it rains liquid farts from the clouds. Go look at the Cassini mission and the Huggins probe, and you'll see what we discovered there. I've talked about it in previous episodes as well, but you can dream about that if you'd like while you're looking at Saturn and Jupiter over there in the southeast rising in the late night hours but you'll have all summer to enjoy this planetary uh, reunion because then later in the early morning hours a third planet the god of war will join them oh. Mars so just to be clear, this is about two o'clock in the morning, but remember Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, not far from the teapot and the scorpion and connect those dots and you get the Zodiac. So all of this information uh, seems overwhelming perhaps, and it might uh, seem confusing. Who's going to remember all these facts and figures? Well, it's not that hard if you go at it a little bit at a time. So I hope these videos have been helpful in uh, giving you folks a, a way to sort of put a reference on your sky. So when you go out there and you look up, you can uh, make sense of the things that you see. But remember that this is a sort of a developing uh, skill set. This is not something that you get all at once. You don't just you know say, check, I learned astronomy. For me, it's a lifelong passion. It's a developing skill and you always are working at it recognizing constellations every day, read the news, I learn new things about astronomy that I never learned. 
so all of you, I hope that these videos have helped make you in, uh, uh, want to be an amateur astronomer, a backyard astronomer, no PhD required, no, uh, you know, debt to college required, just a passion and curiosity for the sky. And I'll leave this uh, presentation for today with the last thing in the sky that I want to focus on because I zoomed way out in Solarium so that we can see the big summer triangle. Here at this distance, you can actually tell, you know, it's a triangle and you can see which is the brightest star, Vega. And then second brightest, Deneb. And then third brightest, Altair. And I've talked about the constellations that we can make with them, Lyra and uh, Cygnus the Swan and Aquila the Eagle. But I want you to think about that more as a, a singular shape, not the individual constellations, but just the summer triangle itself. Because of course, the summer triangle is easy to find and it is the best marker for where you get to see the most luminous, dusty part of the Milky Way. And so maybe this will be a fitting way to end our little online planetarium series because that Milky Way right there, we call it that because the ancient Greeks called it Galactos and Lactos is the Greek word for milk. Galactos means Milky Road. And I hope you're not Galactose intolerant. Sorry, that's one of my oldest jokes. But Galactos, Galaxy, Galactic, Galactation, you can go on and on with this. But the galaxy that we live in is called the Milky Way because of this ancient mythological concept. And it does look like spilled milk. But of course, if you heard this before, this is actually the light of hundreds of billions of stars. And there are so many stars in the Milky Way that in this direction where they're most densely crowded, here's a good example of that, light is blurred together. So here are some cool uh, things, the small Sagittarius star clouds that if you have a telescope you can look for. I'm not even gonna go into all the things that you'll find in that, but look at all the clusters and nebulas and other galaxies that you can see when you look in this direction, it's like looking into Times Square. Okay, this is downtown Milky Way. All the stuff that's happening in our galaxy, there's a concentration of it. And if you look around the other parts of the sky where there isn't a Milky Way, it's still the same galaxy, but this is like the suburbs where things are more distant and not so crowded together. So you've got the suburbs and then you've got the main drag, the main street right here. And that's the Milky Way. And this is the time of year when the Milky Way is best seen all summer long. So you got warm nights, hopefully not too many bugs biting you, lay out a blanket, especially when the moon is not bright, and especially if you live in a place far from city lights and light pollution, which I'm so grateful to live here in Vermont for that reason, then you can see this Milky Way and just think, in this galaxy, we know that there are hundreds of billions of stars. And thanks to missions like the Kepler Space Telescope and the more recent TESS mission for uh, the hunting for exoplanet missions, the ones that we have used to find other worlds, we have been able to find thousands of planets going around the stars in our own galaxy. And the number of planets is over a 4,000 now, which means that we probably have hundreds of billions of worlds in this galaxy. We just haven't begun counting them except in the last 10 years or so. So just imagine all the possibilities that are in this Milky Way galaxy. And just think, are there any other places out there where life exists? Well, it seems like a very fertile garden up there. It seems really weird that we would be the only place where life happened to spring into existence. So who knows? When you look at that Milky Way this summer, think about what all the possibilities are. And also just think about, in addition to the fact that we might get a comet, Comet Neowise, this summer in the sky. Later this summer also, Mar the Mars 2020, now named Perseverance, that rover will be launching to get to the red planet by 2021, uh, next year. And when it gets there, that robot, if all goes well and it lands successfully, it will include a test that will be looking for life. So that mission this coming year, as we will watch it fly for the roughly nine month journey to Mars, and then it lands on Mars, who knows? We might be only months away 
from finding out that there could be life on the red planet that you will see if you stay up late tonight. And if that is discovered this year, I think, well, that'll at least change the headlines for a while. And in reality, I think it'll be one of the greatest discoveries in all of human history to know that life could exist outside of our planet. And if you think people are crazy about space travel and sci-fi, uh, futuristic worlds and living on Mars, if you think people are nuts with that now, just imagine how society is going to change when we know that life does exist outside of the Earth. I think it's going to make an entire generation of space explorer, astronauts, prospectors, maybe smugglers like Han Solo, hopefully not. But you'll understand, I think we'll really become a space-faring civilization once we know life does exist out there. And it's possible that within a few months, we might get that news. And regardless, even if we never find out in the next few years, there's plenty to enjoy when you go outside and look at the stars, see the planets, hopefully see a comet, probably see some meteors. I've seen satellites every night I look up up here on a mountain in the, far from city lights. So I hope you have the luxury to do the same sometime this summer to get to see a very dark sky. But see me at the, player, at the Fairbanks Museum. Uh, otherwise, keep looking up. And thank you all for tuning in and watching all of these. I hope to meet you soon. Be well.